So good to see you again, Bob. It's so nice having you here in New York and everything. I'm glad that uh, connections you were making about your conference. We want to let people know about that conference, perhaps. And then it's so good to see you. Glad we can get this in before you go back to Syracuse. Mm -hmm. And in the audience, welcome. Welcome very much to Conversations. A great personal pleasure on the part of myself to have as a guest here on um, Saturday, the 9th of... Uh, 10th of uh, November 2007, Robert Ashford. Robert Ashford is a dear friend of mine from way back and he is perhaps the most vital voice in terms of a system of understanding economics called binary economics. He was the co-author of a book called Binary Economics, The New Paradigm. And Bob, welcome. It's so good to see you. Welcome to our little mini studio, and it's so good to see you. Well, thank you. It's just an honor and a pleasure to be here again. We've done a number of programs with you, but I wonder, maybe we do. Uh, maybe we got a graphic or two we might show, but could you share just a little bit of your own background? And uh, not real, and then we'll get into discussing economics and binary economics. What sets it apart, in your view, uh, from, uh, let's just say, for want of another term, virtually all conventional notions of economic theory that informs the political and I would say the sociological pattern of Spaceship Earth. Well fine, I'm, I'm a professor of law at Syracuse University. Mm -hmm. I went to Harvard Law School, I was an honors graduate there. Before that I had a major in uh, physics, undergraduate, uh, yeah. and I've always been interested in the issue of uh, economic justice. Uh, and uh, the, the questions of the ecology and the well-being of human beings and the whole planet. So mm. I try to use my skills as a law professor uh, to teach the future lawyers of the world uh -huh. uh, to have a sense of, of, of economic justice and what law can do about it and what lawyers can do about it. What law can do about it. And that, that might relate because you were a close associate in his office with Lewis Kelso. Yes, I worked with Lewis Kelso for many years. Yeah, in San Francisco. In, in San Francisco, yeah. uh, when he had a law firm and then when he founded his investment banking firm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned my binary economics uh, from Lewis Kelso, who's yeah. the originator uh, of this concept. And um, yeah. he always uh, believed that he was, in a sense, the lawyer for the people uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. and, and the, the corporate finance lawyer for the people. And I oftentimes teach my students that the highest role of the lawyer is to help people identify and secure their essential rights, responsibilities, and opportunities in society. So when I say it's important to train the lawyers, it's important to train the lawyers to train the people. People do not have a clear understanding uh -huh. of what their essential economic rights, responsibilities, and opportunities are in society. Most people are are in a bit of a fog about that. It's not their fault because you don't get that kind of learning from the traditional approaches to economics. And it's mystified yeah. and it's beclouded yeah. and our role is to make that understanding more apparent to people so they can act in their own uh, self-interest and for the interest of all people. And maybe be able to understand the larger context within which all human affairs are evolving because things have a way of changing. And they've changed considerably. You use the term new paradigm. Mm -hmm. might be worthwhile, Mr. Kuhn and so forth, a paradigm. What's different between a paradigm and, let's say, another sidebar issue of thinking? Well, a paradigm comes, it was popularized by um, Thomas Kuhn when yeah. he talked about the structure of scientific revolution. He made an observation that wasn't always apparent to the philosophers and, of, of knowledge and science, and that is that we think in paradigms, we think in structures. The word paradigm comes from the Greek, it means example. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it means that, we, that facts aren't just sort of free-floating things out there that mm -hmm. we come to conclude. Facts are determined by a set of rules mm -hmm. uh, that, that govern them. And even people who don't know the rules operate uh, by that notion. We have, we have rules of perception. But the classic example is we used to think the sun went around the earth. We did for a very for long, long time. For, several, for, for thousands of years, because it looks years. that way. Yeah, uh, and now we know that the Earth goes around the sun. That was a shift in paradigms. It's a different fundamental example. One of the things I tell my students is that every morning the sun rises, mm -hmm. every evening the sun sets, you can empirically prove it. It's mm -hmm. cross-cultural. Everybody knows it. Of course. But yeah. it's a complete illusion. Yeah. It's an illusion mm -hmm. built on a false premise. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. some people say it makes no difference one way or the other. But the truth is that if the sun goes around the earth, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. then Newton's laws wouldn't make sense. Yeah. And the whole way in which we got to the moon, the whole foundation of science uh -huh. could not be discovered. It's only when you get the foundation right uh -huh. that then you begin discovering the other issue. Well, and I the same, oh. same thing needs to be done uh, mm -hmm. in, in economics. You know, uh, it's been observed that from 1776, when Adam Smith wrote until today, mm -hmm. there have been 10, 15, depends how you slice them, scientific revolutions, mm -hmm. the way we look at science. And the physical world hasn't changed. Uh, yeah. But from 1776 till uh, today, uh -huh. we are still are fundamentally working with the same paradigm of Adam Smith, which says that the role of capital is to make labor more productive, mm -hmm. and that the distribution of ownership has no fundamental relationship to economic growth, to the accumulating wealth of nations, unless somehow it makes people more productive. Right. And that's his paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, he said that, that Adam Smith's uh, and Mar Karl Marx, although we yeah. think of the opposite yeah. of Adam Smith, didn't disagree. He no. believed in the same idea that capital makes labor more productive. Uh -huh. And Alfred Marshall, who brought us what we call neoclassical economics, yeah. that's sort of the economics of the Republican Party, uh -huh. uh, it's the same premise. Capital makes labor, and productivity yeah. is the key to growth. And that Efficient allocation, and that's the key. And John Maynard Keynes didn't disagree, and, mm -hmm. and Milton Friedman didn't disagree, well, I was and John Kenneth Galbraith didn't disagree. But Lewis Kelso did but disagree. Did, that's right. He said the role of capital is not to make labor more productive. The role of capital is to do ever, ever more of the work. Mm -hmm. So to give the audience a simple idea of how you, what the difference is, mm -hmm. think, of the, think of a person sawing a board, 10 boards an hour with a handsaw. Okay, I've done it. And 100 boards an hour with a machine saw. Now, Adam Smith never actually saw a machine, but in the example that we're given here, he would say that the role of capital makes the laborer more productive. The mm. capital has made the labor ten times more. And that's the theory of economic growth that we have today. Whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, a right-winger, a left-winger, capitalist or a communist, that's the theory of growth. That's a very big statement and a very real. I want and, to go and it's back wrong, and yeah, it's the wrong theory. I know, I, it, wrong in a sense, but I want to go back and let but Mr. Before, um, before, let me just do right. one more thing. Let me just give okay. The, okay. The, the, the audience okay. the other notion, uh -huh. and then you go on. And that is, that think of the Industrial Revolution this way. You hauled a sack and you're exhausted. I am with the, yes. Yeah. A but you put, ten, sack you put ten sacks on a horse mm -hmm. and go twice as far in half the time. Mm -hmm. The horse has done something marvelously important that's got nothing to make the person who's leading the horse more productive. Right. The horse is doing most of the extra work. Mm -hmm. And if you look at 1776, 1876, 1976, 2006, till now we get to 2007, the difference is not that capital makes labor more productive and that we're working so much more more productively. Mm -hmm. The difference mm -hmm. is that capital is doing most of the work. And not only is capital doing more and more of the work, capital has the capacity to distribute more and more of the income. Uh -huh. And it's concentrated ownership that prevents capital from distributing the income, which would ne necessarily and efficiently allow people to acquire what is increasingly produced by the combination of capital and labor. So that's, that's the key. Yeah. The, more, the broader distribution of capital acquisition, mm -hmm. the more broadly capital is acquired, the more we will soak up unused capacity in a profitable way, uh -huh. and the more we will grow. Uh -huh. And that notion is not found in Smith, that notion is not found in Marx, that notion is not found in neoclassical economics, or Keynesian, or, Keynesian, or Friedman, Friedman, or Galbraith, or, or any oh, yeah. of those people. The mm -hmm. idea that the broader pattern of capital acquisition, mm -hmm. the process of capital buying itself, Mm -hmm. with the value of its own work. The more broadly capital is acquired, mm -hmm. the more broadly income is distributed, the more broadly there's a market for products, the more we absorb and profitably employ unused capacity, and the faster we grow. Yeah. And, and the more we employ technology to solve the problems of the environment. Mm -hmm. All of those things are a natural flow of a single observation that is not in mainstream economics today. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be. But is basic uh, to uh, your binary notion. Since you've been talking about 1776, we got a chart, and maybe we go to we can go to that. It's one of Lewis's charts. You're yes, familiar it with it. Yes. But this, if we go to there, you got it on the screen now. And this is okay. It's blink. Let me try this. Wait a minute. It's just hold on. 
Oh, it's okay. That's a fine chart. Yeah, right there. This is a chart of Louis Kelso, and as you can see, it's changing participation of labor <coughs> workers. And off on the left of the screen, <coughs> that would be 1776. That was a definitely defining year. That was the year of the capitalist, uh, of the uh, wealth of nations. The steam engine was invented then. Adam Smith wrote the wealth of nations. We made a revolution across the ocean from the feudal the democracy. Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, democracy. Uh, uh, thing. That mm -hmm. was 7076. And what this is on one side of the chart, it's worth thinking about because it sort of encapsulates some of what you're saying, is that through time, as we went, you can see 10% on this, this is Lewis Kelso's assumption if there were uh, competitive markets and so forth. About 10% of the actual production in the economy, say, of colonial America or pre-revolutionary America was something other than labor. Labor was incredibly important because we didn't have much technology. We had a hatchet to cut down a tree and so forth. And then if you go through time, he makes an assumption about those input ratios or, uh, and you got increasingly it is something other than human labor. And that would include not just the worker on the line, that's uh, all intellectual and physical input to the productive process by human, uh, by human beings, let's say. And that he's got an estimate that it's up, as you can see on the chart, by the time we get to the modern era, those things may have almost like reversed in terms of the reality by which goods and services are actually produced. 90% of the production is the result of something other than human labor, but all of our economic theory which in turn informs all of the political process, mm -hmm. which in turn informs all of the intellectual uh, training and so forth at our universities or our public intellectuals or anything else, is all based upon a system that was, that was established that is basically, the premise behind it is this labor theory of the value. Idea. The Marxists will do it because they want to, or the left will do it because they say we want to let the people get a better labor standing, a uh, better living standard by having w good wages for their labor input to it. And the capitalists might, some uh, might do it in order to, to um, you know, uh, camouflage the fact that all the capital assets are owned by a tiny plutocratic class and getting more plutocratically owned and uh, they are the ones who set the template for the world society mm -hmm. and we're all in a certain sense, some people observe, rather like serfs on a feudal estate because they set the templates for the universities, for the think tanks and for everything else. And so this is a major part, the basis of a major paradigm shift. You, and does this hold in terms of your perception? Well, this, this you, is a valuable you, you, chart? You've accurately described it and I think the key to understand for the audience is that if you subscribe to the Smith, Marx, Marshall, Keynes, Friedman, Galbraith approach. China. If you if you the if, whole su world. if you the subscribe whole world, to the, yeah. the 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 old paradigm, mm -hmm. then you will say that the way to help poor and working people is to provide them jobs and welfare, and the way to aid in that is to help rich people acquire capital with the earnings of capital so they can provide jobs and welfare for everybody else. That's how all our policies are set If up. you're a binary economist, you'd mm -hmm. say it's fine to provide jobs and welfare, mm -hmm. but you have to add to that mm -hmm. the right for the poor people as well as the rich people, the mm -hmm. working people as well as, as well as the existing owners, mm -hmm. also to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. You don't have to, you don't have to surrender a plea for jobs, better jobs, and more welfare, but you have to add to that the plea that everyone has the right to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. And just as I can distill the economic of that essence of binary economics as saying the broader, more broadly capital is acquired with the earnings of capital, mm -hmm. the, more, the, the more profitably we will employ unused capacity and promote growth. Just as I can summarize binary economics in that single, single sentence, I can, I can summarize the private property aspects the law aspects of this by saying that everybody needs the right to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. Well, so when the audience hears of some pro-ownership argument, and there are very few pro-ownership arguments, for example, President Bush talked about a ownership, ownership society. Yeah. But, but yeah. When, when the, don't, don't be fooled, ladies and gentlemen of the audience. You have to ask yourself, if you're talking about ownership, are you talking about giving me the right to acquire capital with the earning of capital? That is enabling me to protect. If, it, if you're not you enabling me to acquire yeah. capital with the earnings of capital, not with the earnings of labor, yeah. not with welfare redistribution, mm -hmm. acquiring, if you're not enabling me to acquire capital with the earnings of capital, then you're not doing the binary approach 
and you're not using the approach that will create the real level playing field. And that what, that's what needs to be learned. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty mm -hmm. is that most people don't understand that. Someone comes to your office and says, I'm hungry, I haven't eaten in a day, well, you buy them lunch. Mm -hmm. That's the welfare approach. You give them immediate, we need that because the system doesn't work to yeah. enable everybody. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes to your office and says, I'm out of a job, I, haven't, I can't find a job. You try to help them to find a job. Because you know, people know to come in when they're hungry and say, I need food. Mm -hmm. People know when, when they need a job. They know that. But they don't know that they can come in your office and say, by the way, just the way the Rockefellers and the DuPonts acquire capital and the Gateses uh, and, the, and the Buffets acquire capital with the earnings of capital, so too do I need to acquire capital with Me. the earnings of capital. And you're just John and, Q. Citizen. Right. You're not a they, they can, People do no. not know that, that that process, if we universalize it, will mm -hmm. create more growth, mm -hmm. will create more profitable enterprise, mm -hmm. will create a technology that will solve the ecology problems. People don't know that that possibility exists, mm -hmm. and that's what needs to be taught. Okay, that's really, I wonder if I could back up a little bit in the discussion and go back to Mr. Newton. I'd like to let Mr. Newton off the hook a little bit. All right. Bit. When he, he, or Ptolemy, or whoever set up systems uh, that had the sun going around, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the earth at the center of the universe. I'd kind of like to let them off the hook in a certain sense because the, um, because the state of knowledge that was available or the evolution of knowledge and the development of things and the alteration of the realities was such that it was very difficult for, let's say, if we go back to primitive man, to be able to get an understanding of things that we come to understand so that as things advance, uh, things, new, new realities become available to our consciousness, to our knowledge, and so we should be a little bit easy on the people who have, uh, like Mr. Newton or Mr. Ptolemy or whoever set up those things, uh, without looking with too much disdain upon them who were working within a knowledge base you could or say a reality. It was, a, it was, an it was different mistake. than what the modern world is It was an honest available. mistake. It was an honest yes, mistake. Yes, that's right. And we want to let, and it might be, that's part Nobody's of Nobody's criticizing. No, not that's right. And also we might be able to apply that to people who are responsible for our historically inherited institutions. As you're saying, if it is virtually all of our economic theory, that would include all of the political candidates for the current presidential election, all of the universities, all of the institutions. They were all formulated the, within... All the media. All the media. Uh, it, it, virtually the entire world, if they were formulated within a, a certain, for want of a better term, the ontologic reality of, uh, uh, that has become fundamentally altered and so forth, then I think it's possible for us to not get all exercised about them as being something evil or something. People are used to being in conditions, but the conditions change. And if that's the case, then that's what we have to do. Okay. It yeah, uh, that's all I'm mistake. saying. I want, to, I want to, in a certain sense, it might open upon the idea of not being, uh, of taking full advantage of what the present is offering without being all uh, caught up within a dialectic that they are evil or that they're bad or there's something. And so much of the political dialogue or the discussion, because people get their identities by those, those mm -hmm. old institutions that were there, and that's something that if that's upset, People get very upset when they're identified. There's a lot of confusion. Let me just say one thing about, in order to clear up what we've been said right now, the word capital mm -hmm. is used in at, three, at least three different ways. And it's important for the audience, in order to arm themselves, to equip themselves to understand their rights, need to understand uh -huh. Uh -huh. that one use of the word capital is physical capital. Uh -huh. Land, machines, tools, structures, inventions of various sorts. Mm -hmm. That's the way... Smith and Marx and Keynes use the term capital. That's mm -hmm. one word. Yeah. Another, and that, if you, were, if you know about accounting, that's what's on the left-hand side of the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Then there's another word. It's called financial capital. Mm -hmm. That's the stocks and the bonds that are issued as claims, mm -hmm. ownership claims on the real capital. Mm -hmm. That's on the other side of the balance sheet. So when, when, when somebody talks to you about economics, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. and they say capital, you say, well, well wait a minute. Do you mean real capital or do you mean financial capital? Make this Never decision. let anybody talk to you about economic theory or finance or, or property rights or economic justice or economic policy or ecology or any issue of this sort without saying, wait a minute, do you mean physical capital, which is on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, or do you mean financial capital, which is on the right-hand side of the balance sheet, in almost every company except a, a bank, which in which there's some reversals of that. But it's a fundamental principle, so never let that be done. 
The final thing is Unders we just yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Well, and the no, other no, thing I want you to go back and underscore that because that's probably right. we can confusing stop. a lot we of people. No, you don't have to stop. But you know, underscore that again. That's a distinction well, that the, probably is not very well the, understood the, and is important. Yeah. The, and should the, be. the horse, which or or, or the truck, or the, the truck, the 10, or, the, or the locomotive. Yes, uh, all these different. Th that's real capital. Those mm -hmm. things are doing work. Mm -hmm. Financial capital is a claim on real capital. Financial capital in itself of itself does not do work. Physical capital does work. And, and that's the, it's one distinction. And one's on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, which is a real asset. And financial capital is simply a claim. Do these apply to capital. an information environment it that implies we're rapidly to coming into? A patent, a patent is legislated capital. And mm -hmm. that's certainly about, By the way, there's nothing new about the information environment except a matter of degree. The first, uh, pre, the, the first humanoid that took up a stone or a, or a, or a scrape and began doing something with a tool mm -hmm. was a knowledge worker. There's mm -hmm. nothing new about knowledge working. Do not be mystified about that, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. There's nothing new. It's simply a matter of degree. Mm -hmm. But what knowledge does do, mm -hmm. once you invent something, is it allows you to create real physical instruments that mm -hmm. embody that knowledge. Mm -hmm. The automobile is an embodiment of knowledge, mm -hmm. but the automobile does its own work. The truck does its own work. Yeah. Now, this, j just to give you a sense also of, of the, in the importance of this observation that capital does its own work, mm -hmm. there are six things that capital can do mm -hmm. that, is totally that are totally obscured when we think of capital making labor more productive. The first thing capital does is it makes, it replaces labor. It is doing and that. that. And that means it creates... Lord it, Keynes it, it, warned It replaces about labor that. And, and therefore it creates leisure for the mm -hmm. people who own the output of the capital, but not mm -hmm. for the others. Now the second thing that capital does, now you almost never simply replace the work of labor with the work of capital. Anytime you use capital, you get vastly more productive power. Mm -hmm. We can't compete with horses or trucks for hauling. So the idea that capital substitutes for labor is only, it's less than a half truth. Capital vastly supplements the work of labor with mm -hmm. the work. Now the third thing capital does, and this has got nothing to do with re labor replacement. Mm -hmm. Capital does work that labor can never do. You know, ladies and gentlemen, that a farmer never grew an apple. All a farmer can do is help a tree grow an apple. Oh. So this idea that farmers grow apples is pure homocentric hubris. There's a lot Capitals of homocentric Capital, things Capital, we, yeah. we can marvel at the computer revolution, but we cannot make a single computer chip because our hands are too big. That's right. All we can do no is guide physical. They're going physical, toward All we can do is guide, guide physical. So this idea that human beings... Capital works without labor. I always tell people, you think that capital doesn't own, do its own work, try living without your washing machine for a change. I can tell you that capital does tons and tons of work uh, without labor. And you might say, well, it takes the person to press the button, but the work of button pressing uh, with respect to a washing machine is not the work uh -huh. of the washing machine. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You see, well, the binary kind of says, look at the, look at the work. So people say, well, it takes the person to lead the horse. But if you put 10 sacks on 10 people's back and I led them, what I say, well, I'm doing, the, I'm doing the leading, so I'm doing the work. How can you deny the work of the 10 people hauling this? How can you deny the work of the horse? How can you deny the work of the truck? It's irrational. To yeah, me. yeah, but people so, get... So those are th four ways yeah. in which capital... And the other thing capital can do, two more. All right. Capital Let's can acquire itself on the promise of its future income. That's the notion you've heard. You, you, money makes money. You can all you you it can does, you, yeah. you you invest in things that pay for themselves out of the future earnings. Out of the future earnings. Savings. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And the sixth thing capital can do is distribute the income available to purchase its output. Mm -hmm. And that's why the more broadly capital is acquired, these instruments doing more and more of the work, the more they distribute broadly income to the population. Mm -hmm the more we will soak up unused capacity. And I think we have a lot of unused capacity. Okay, that's an and issue. To grow growth. Oh, and, that's and, an and issue. And then promote growth. Yeah, and you talked about it, and it promotes growth and the unutilized capacity. Uh, un we have a capability of producing. I think in the app, beyond just the, the sense of the factory is built, it can turn things out. But this, in terms of the evolving capability that we have, you could take almost axiomatically that the percentage, the ability to provide for the goods and needs of the human population due to technological productiveness is increasing the percentage of the world population that might be able to be seen to be haves as opposed to have-nots <coughs> yes. through time. 
and that you think we have a large in, uh, capacity to provide goods and services, and that is not being utilized because the system <coughs> that we've inherited does not let us let That's us right. uh, do what it is we have the capability right. of doing in terms of providing human needs. I do believe that. And it could be drawn. And that would be part of a context where you might be able to have a new alteration in the economics mm -hmm. without going through the process of redistributing. You don't need any redistribution. Peter, taking from you don't Peter need a paper. penny weight's worth of... Re let, let, the or, the, uh, unutilized productive capacity is an issue. Mm -hmm. It's a very important issue and it's almost never really talked about. Now, first of all, it's important to recognize it's a fact question. It's yeah, not, that's not a value question. And it's also a historical, it's, a value, it's, a, it's also it's a fact a, question. A, a, an historical trend. If you say that there are a greater number, it's easier now to imagine if you were king I of the world so. to provide for everybody than it would have been in 15th century. Yes. We make new discoveries, yes. we make new capabilities, we have technological, and every day, Robert, there's a, 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 another revolution coming in and, and we don't another use field it. over we, the transom. And we don't employ it. And we, yeah, but we have a system in place that won't let us do collectively to benefit the human society and the ecology right. because we are enthralled to institutions that were formulated with a different uh, reality coming out of history back to letting Mr. Uh, you know, off, off the hook, the people that were tied into... Con the con the, that's, that's uh, but, the, but the first thing to recognize is that it's a fact question, it's not a value question. You uh, can love it or hate it, but either we do have unused capacity or we don't. That's the or, first thing. Or could capacity the same as capability? I would call it the same. We have, but it's no. but it's important to recognize too that economists, who will quarrel, some of whom will quarrel with this, mm -hmm. have a different definition of unused capacity than the one I'm using. Yeah, uh, economists t take the existing plant equipment that's mm -hmm. not being used oh. as a numerator, and the total plant and equipment as denominator, and they say that's the cap capacity, the unused capital capacity, yeah. and they take the unemployment rate, and that's the labor capacity. Mm -hmm. That's a static notion. Mm -hmm. Once you recognize that we have the capacity to make more capacity, yeah. We could we today could make many many more plants and that don't do anything that don't do anything you know <laughs> like pyramids so or so, in so the old days. now this is a fact question now mm -hmm. I believe that we have vast huge unutilized capacity Perhaps I also believe oh. ladies and gentlemen if you're concerned about poor and working people that the making unutilized capacity an issue will help you whether you believe in binary economics or not yeah uh, in 1933 when we had the Great Depression which brought in the Keynesian approach yeah of redistribution and government involvement, which is not the binary approach. Uh, we used to have plane, we had passenger trains going through the country without passengers, freight trains going through the country without freight, mm -hmm. full of people looking for work. Yeah, uh, The essence of unused capacity, even in the static sense of what we had. Yeah, that's in the static But I say we have, I think if, if you wanted to feed and clothe and shelter the world today with the capacity we have, you could come much closer to it uh, than we do. I think we have more unused capacity today, but today, Unused capacity is a politically undeniable fact. Yeah. The right wing doesn't want you to know about unutilized, un unutilized productive capacity. They want you to think that markets are nearly perfectly efficient except for government meddling yeah. and that uh, the only way you can help Peter is to take from Paul. Yeah. They love to be in this argument of how much redistribution. Yeah, that, that, and the poor, and the that right, frames and the, the political and the, discussion. And the left wing pl yeah. plays right into their hands mm -hmm. by saying, yes, yeah, right, we, it's, good, it's good to take from Peter to pay Paul. Why does the progressive community not see the logic of how there should be ownership? Are they uh, tied into this idea I, uh, through labor? I, input and labor union organizing, find jobs, and all of your political organizations will say what we're going to do is well, create jobs for people to do things to get income through their labor participation. I think it's, They're committed to I that. I think it's a very complicated answer as to why, it, you know, the first person to propose that the earth goes around the sun was a, a Greek Egyptian named, or an Egyptian Greek named Aristarchus in the third century AD. You're partial we, to we, the Greeks. We you were, have a little Greek heritage yourself. Well, we, we, were still, we were still burning people at the stake in yeah. 1600 for that. You mean so, we up in North <coughs> Europe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I mean, one level, par the, the problem with the dominant paradigm mm -hmm. is that simultaneously makes you think that there's no other way to think about something. Oh, yeah, Tina. And, and yet, and remember, yet. Remember Mrs. Thatcher saying, yeah. there is no alternative. That's right. The Tina principle okay. to bring in Reaganomics that's that's and so right. forth. Yeah. But, but, so the, the dominant paradigm makes you think that there's no other way of looking at something. Uh -huh. And the, uh, the other thing is you think you're still perfectly free to think for yourself. Uh -huh. So that's, that's a part of it. Uh -huh. There is also the illusion that capital makes labor 
uh, more productive. It is an illusion. Uh -huh. There is also the sense of needing to uh, aggrandize and, and make holy work because mm -hmm. if you can't acquire capital with the earnings of capital because you're excluded, then you need to amplify the arguments let's talk for more pay for less work. There are many talk, complicated Yeah, reasons. let's talk a little bit about that work ethic and mm -hmm. let's say, because I know Lewis used to talk about there were pr provisions made in thinking and so forth because they wanted to avoid parasitism. Some people are going to work hard, other people are going to loaf around and everything, and you had to avoid that. And that's in the Buddhist ethic, it's in virtually all the ethics, there's something to avoid parasitism, as it were. But now, as Lord Keynes argued in that letter to his grandchildren in 1930, which is about now, we're going to be confronted, he said, with a thing that you can't hardly see, we're going to be confronted with technologically induced massive unemployment. Yes. that the technological systems are going to be productive beyond outsourcing. They're going to be able to displace the labor process. They're going to be able to overwhelmingly productive. So we're going to have to have some other way other to distribute income other than uh, through labor criteria. And we've got all these institutions that have been formulated out of a particular well, condition that has been changed fundamentally. That's to, my thought. I mean, I'm all Louis Kelso used to say unemployment's wonderful if you can afford it. Yes, right, I mean, that, right. And, yeah, that, and, and the point is you can afford unemployment if you are a capital owner. That's right. And there are two ways to do and work. And if everyone's a capital One, owner, you can afford higher levels, levels of right. unemployment for that's people right. to do what they want to that's do right. rather than what the masters who own the capital assets set as a template. And everyone, <coughs> again, to use the analogy, are right. like serfs on a feudal estate, yeah. the feudal estate owners in this case being our banking plutocratic class. Now there are those who will, who will resist what you say because they say it's, not, the it's, not, it's not just the pinnacle rich because there's lots of middle class people who invest in the stock market and, and so there will be that talk. But you need to look at the Mr. Wolf, Ed Wolf from Ed Wolf, yeah, NYU, yeah, yeah. he's got statistics. The basic rule is this folks, 1% of the people own about 50% of the wealth 10% own 90%, and that leaves 90% scrambling for the rest, and most people have a negative net worth. So yes, numerically speaking, there are lots of uh, uh, small and middle class uh, capital owners, but they don't own much. New York Stock Exchange boast, boasts no. that it has about 55 million stockholders, but the average stockholder is 46-year-old male, has about a $15,000 uh, a nest egg. Which that doesn't is, get you far. You cannot, it's not a, what they call a viable capital estate. Right. So it's a little bit like that river that's 15 miles wide but and mostly an inch quarter deep. Quarter inch deep, yeah. And, and so you have to look at that mm. uh, and you have to recognize that wealth is concentrated and almost all capital is acquired with the earnings of capital. Now if it was Say true... That again. Say it, that again. Say that again. That, that almost all capital is acquired with the earnings of capital. Okay. And, and, uh, and, and, yeah. and uh, we need to universalize that process where everybody can ac acquire capital. The other thing to recognize about unused capacity uh, that's important here, there are two different aspects. One aspect, there are those that worry about the ecology, and I do too. Of course. But we have, for most ecological problems, there's a green way of doing it that people cannot afford, which is itself an example of unused capacity. That's another one, yeah. And, and so the, sec and the second thing to recognize when we talk about unused capacity, let's, talk, let's get into the big league. You, know, you don't want lawyers spending time when they give you a bill on trivial points. Let's get to the big league. America's 3,000. <laughs> a lot of them around. Yeah, there I mean, are. Yeah. Too, and that's unethical. Yeah. Uh, so so let's, the, when you look at America's 3,000 largest companies, you're looking at most of the productive capacity in America. Okay. Most of those companies, the three thousand, not the most of those companies. Most of those companies, mm -hmm. most Russell. of those companies, it's a pyramid. It goes, yeah, yeah. But if you take three thousand, you've got about ninety, ninety-five percent of the that productive okay, ca yeah. capacity yeah, right. in the country. Now, uh -huh. um, most of those companies could make more of what they're making uh -huh. at lower unit costs. Mm -hmm. Only if people had money to buy. That's right. And say, say that on and a so world they all scale. Have. Think of that on a world yeah. scale. You've That's got right. people that That's don't right. have enough money to buy a piece of penicillin. Right. Think, think, think well, about what the make. market for market for, for America's products would would do if the if the average wage in the world went from three dollars a day to five dollars a day. It'd okay. be huge. Well, again, the uh, wage, say, distributing uh, ownership will distribute income, which will it, distribute market power, yeah. which will employ unused capacity, which will promote growth. Okay. That's the simple. It's a very simple theory. Is it folks. fair to talk it's about? It's not really complicated. Yeah, it, it, you've been mystified. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you've been mystified. Well, the, again, and back to uh, back to the thing. There's a guy who wrote Marshall Rosenberg or somebody, and he says, you know, a nonviolent way of seeing it. Whether or not we're going to, we're at a time, Robert, in the evolution of consciousness, this part of the universe, mm -hmm. where through our cleverness, we began that first tool way back 200,000 mm -hmm. years ago with a stick, 
and we had mm -hmm. to feed off a sure. leopard or something, and those leopards were eating mm -hmm. us with alarming regularity, I believe. And we finally get to the point where extending our consciousness through technology, uh, much of that being led by political war-making capability, the money all goes to the war mm -hmm. contract, daddy war box, and so forth. We get to the point now, apparently, Monsieur Kaku, I don't know, this is something that should be on every think tank wall, I think. Is it true, or do you have any thought, uh, thinking philosophically and certain how these things are seen? If there was to be, and look what's going on in Pakistan, look what's going on in the Middle East, look what's going on now in terms of the ancient hatreds coming to the fore with no visionary leadership about how to address fundamental issues that confront the evolution of human society and so forth, only the old paradigms being reified and so forth. If the weapons were to be unleashed, apparently, it's only modeling, possibility, but apparently it means there would not be, if they were to be unleashed, like Guns of August, there would not be a single human being left alive on this planet. Do you think that's true? And if it is, is it sufficiently um, ensconced, as it were, or instantiated within the consciousness of the world population that that sets off, that, that, can, that is part of a dialectic that uh, is existentially significant and that it's not adequately realized? Or is, will there be a few survivors, uh, like after the Second World War, we could wipe out uh, cities, tribes, and so forth, but that we're not at a new existential reality in terms of the evolution of events on this planet or not? That's on the negative side. We could talk about the positive side as the inverse of that negative uh, scenario. But what is your thought on that large issue of how destructive well, our technology has become? I, I have to say that, that I am here taking up the audience's time and yours because I am an expert in, in something very limited, in a sense, but very important, and that's binary economics. Yeah. I, I really don't have an opinion on that in, in a sense okay. of a professional opinion. No, I, I, know, I, will, I, I will say you're an educated I, I will say that my sense is mm -hmm. that if we unleashed all the destructive power that we have. All, that's another kind of unutilized capacity. That is a good unused Which is, good, which is, a, good, which is a good unused capacity. That's right. You know, and remember, we want to put yeah. that if, forth. If we oh, did, I would uh, bet I on the... I want to put that forth in order to find what might be the positive, existentially, equally significant mm -hmm. uh, alteration in terms of the human condition that has occurred as we reached a point mm -hmm. of Promethean capability on the positive side and what might formulate a description of what that alteration is. But on the destructive But side. anyway, if I, if I were betting, and this is, folks, this is not a professional decision. No. This is just a, I would bet on the cockroaches. I, yeah. I, would, I would think that the cockroaches will, will do quite well. There are a lot of people who would but, say that. But, but, uh, I bet Nick <clears throat> the Greek would take a bet that they're going to unleash but, these weapons. But, uh, if you but, I, think but about, I do that's think staggering. that the seeds of conflict can be substantially reduced if we come to peace with technology. And coming to peace with technology is enabling people to own a share of it. That's a way to and arrive as, as a way to... Right. Now, another thing, I'm, I'm always concerned about giving the audience a, a handle on this. Uh, some people do know about microcredit. And yeah, there's Mr. Mohammed Yunus, Yunus yeah. who got a Nobel Prize, a wonderful uh, thought for microcredit. And that's mm -hmm. the idea. If you give a, 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 a woman in Bangladesh a loan to buy a sewing machine, mm -hmm. that before she had no access to the loan to buy the sewing machine, that machine. but and therefore she was selling her labor at, at marginal very low uh, value whereas if she owns the machine the combination of her labor and her capital can increase her la living standard she'll pay back the loan and, my, and Mohammed Yunus and that system has has proliferated and there are even those that are getting involved that I think are not so altruistic yeah. but that idea now that's what I would call the local breeze of capitalism uh -huh. And the interesting thing is about binary economics is it always gives you the ability to ask sharp questions. And I would, I, if I could represent the woman in Bangladesh, and she's my client, I would say, um, you know, that's the low and fine, and it's gonna, it, it helps you a little bit in the local breeze. But, you know, I, I'm going to observe something. The Rockefellers, the DuPonts, Bill Gates, uh, Warren Buffett is not interested in that investment because it's not a... It's not a cutting edge investment. They would be more interested in an investment that would give them a piece of a diversified ownership of the garment industry. The now, world the, garment the, the industry. Gar the world, uh, that's something that would interest them. And you know what? If they're interested in that, you ought to be interested in that. And there's a way <laughs> that it can be done. Doing, and, yeah. and further yeah. than that, not only the garment industry, every rich person in America, mm -hmm. every rich person in America has a diversified portfolio 
of America's 3,000 largest companies. Right. If that's what the rich people are interested in, then you poor and working people, when you think about jobs and welfare, think about how I might acquire a diversified portfolio in America's companies. Well, the truth is, the people who hold those gates, those gatekeepers, are not taught the economics that I'm able to teach at Syracuse University. They're not taught the economics that a few of us understand from the binary point of view. Since so, so they're not taught that, they don't see the profit motive. They don't see the profit motive. They don't see the distributive consequences. They don't see the benefit of this. So in a sense, we have, it's a two-step process. We have to teach the common man and woman, Mary and John Q. Public, who may know a great deal about X, Y, or Z, but not this, and we also have to teach their experts. Mm -hmm. And that's the issue, mm -hmm. to increase the understanding. Mm -hmm. if, the, if capital will buy itself for the rich, then in an economy that it's not at full capacity... If it's capacity, wired correctly. If it's, if if it's wired correctly if ca if ca with uh, the listen, invisible it, structure if that is capital needed, is, changes. If capital can buy itself for the rich in an economy that is not producing at full capacity, it can buy itself even more profitably if everybody is included in the process. And, be and you can do that without a penny weights worth of redistribution. Yeah. If you're not at full capacity, you can make Paul richer without taking from Peter, mm -hmm. which destroys the whole left-right argument as being totally irrelevant mm -hmm. to the economic potential okay. that we have. That's right. One thing I want to go back to the thing, and we go back to Aristotle saying it'll have to be slaves to support the few who live well until and unless the loom learns to weave. The loom may be learning to weave now. We could have a the world. The loom does not, weave. We, we're be able to have a world now. And back to the positive side of that metaphor, the, my suggestion is, and it seems to go unheard and everything, is that there's been a qualitative change in want of the better term, the ontology, the reality. It's all invisible, it's not seen and so forth. But Buckminster Fuller made a trend. I want to just make a quick mention. We'll get back to the binary and everything. But he made a, a thing that that trend is that there were a higher percentage of the population of the world could seem to be halves through time because of our technological productiveness. And he said that we had approached the point where there were, and you could say, haves, have-nots. Maybe you could bring up a little chart we got at Fuller. Just bring it up quick, Bob. Okay, this is his chart, and he said by the time we got to the First World War, there were maybe 10% of the world population would realistically be able to be seen to be haves. You have to have a definition of terms of what it means to be a have. Is that power needed again? Um, well, I don't know. Okay, take it off, yeah. Anyway, and he said by the Second World War, we got to 20, and he said that we were on a trend along the trend along the destructive line where the higher percentages <coughs> of the world population could be seen to be at. Not the reality. It's not the reality. It's the capacity, unutilized capacity, the capability we have, nanotechnology, all these things that are developing now and so forth, to where he said that in his reckoning from 1952, we were approaching a major crucial point in the evolution of consciousness where there would be in reality terms, not, not the reality in the sense of cap capability, more haves and have-nots on planet Earth for the first time in the evolution of universal consciousness that we were, in a sense, transcending, in terms of our capability, material scarcity as an ontologic reality, and that had been the context in which all human history had unfolded and all our institutions were in place. That's another major qualitative transformation that may be characteristic of the time in which we find ourselves and make possible things that were not possible back in, in, in previous previous era. That's what I'm saying, part of a mm -hmm. paradigm shift. Just wanted to get that in. Well, good. You know, if you want to put on the board, you might want to put on that other chart. If we Just can get the, if we can get the, uh, the machine to cooperate, the one... I'll try, yeah. We're having a little trouble with the technology. You want the six chart? Uh, just to say it. Just yeah, to show if we it. can. So Let's see if we can get this. See, I don't know how to make this. Here we go. Now you might... Wait a minute. Try it now. Yeah, there. All right. Now, this is Lewis Kelso's chart, this and this is, is chart. something... Now, and this, uh, this is, it, if I may, general theory of uh, a Kelsonian notion of the national economy of the United States, national economy as a mentor economy to yeah. the world. The principles apply on a larger scale to get past the tradition, uh, what is needed in order to bring in right. a binary and system. I, and I can take a few minutes to try to explain. This is fully explained, by the way, in, my, in, in the book with Rodney Shakespeare, Binary Economics, a New Paradigm. It's fully explained, and we can't do it full justice now. But it just to get, bring us back to the part of the discussion that has the, the woman in Bangladesh acquiring 
the sewing machine, but how do we enable her to acquire a diversified portfolio the loom in, Aristotle's in, in, term. in the diversified portfolio in, let's say, the world's 6,000 or 8,000 largest companies? It's that issue. Right. And now what this chart shows are six major institutions that exist today. The one on the top left shows a single corporation, or you could think about it as America's 3,000 largest companies all in that box, or you could think about it as the world's six or 7,000 largest companies. Or even residential companies. real estate. Uh, we could th any, any, anything, yeah. anything of that sort. So that, that is one thing. This, the, that's the box on the top left. The, the, the box immediately to its right is a lender. It shows a lender, and, uh -huh. that's, and that's the second box. It's a lending institution. The, bottom, the one that's on the bottom left is a trust. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, rich people use are they use trusts in order to isolate themselves uh, from uh, liability. The corporation itself is a, is a, is a limited liability entity and then uh, so that uh, it protects your assets as an investor. The trustees are people that make decisions. I'm sure, I don't believe that, that, my guess is that Paris Hilton doesn't actively uh, work on her investment decisions. It's done for Most her. Most people so, want investment so they, advice. So the rich people yeah. use trusts. Mm -hmm. Now the institution to the right and the top is an insurance company. It's a process of insuring the risk of capital investment. Uh, casualty insurance. Casualty insurance. Yeah. Like FHA insurance yeah. is applied to loan, home loans but industrialized capital. I can tell you that the rich people love insurance mechanisms. They also use directly and indirectly government reinsurance yeah. in different well, contexts. Minute. Government reinsurance. They, they, do, they use that. They uh, use yeah. that. We have an example of that in the FHA. That was Lloyd. Yeah. Lloyd but, there are other, but there are other th things that governments do to ensure the risk of loss. Reinsuring uh, the capital insurance, insurance. That's right. industry That's that right. could be expanded to guard against loss That's right. of investment That's right. investments and rich people use that, that cannot be allowed in a crapshoot kind of venture kind of uh, mentality if this is going to be responsible for the distribution of income uh, large to it, the society. Re, re, it has to be more stable. Reinsurance re you know? is, is, a, is a proven concept. Co co uh, re insurance companies uh, sell a part of their risk to other companies. Some of it's, gov some of it's done through the government. Uh, that, that it's, it, no, and, and, the, and the government, re, and the government uh, reinsures in other ways too by policies that protect. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that protectionist policies are an example. So we have that. Finally, we have the central bank. The central That's bank it. is involved in protecting uh, the process by which capital acquires itself with the earnings of capital. It, it stabilizes the money supply. It has other functions too, but the central bank is, 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 is largely what facilitates. That's the, the federal, acquisition. Yeah. Now the question is, what that's the, the Federal Reserve, federal Reserve in, in the United in, in States the and that's central right. banks that's around right. the world? Now the right. question is, uh, what, do we limit credit to the woman who owns no capital to enable her to buy a sewing machine, mm -hmm. or can we let her benefit by these very same six institutions that help the Rockefellers and the Duponts? And yeah. why should we do so? And the, Particularly if the technology is increasingly responsible for production, sure. as Lord Keynes argued about and then we get down to things sure. where everybody is arguing over yeah. uh, you know like Mr. Mr. Nixon said we're all Keynesian now 1972 no. you know what we are now something <coughs> for along the lines of Friedman and Shumpeter <coughs> or something and they don't have an alternative you're trying to bring an alternative trying to bring an alternative and we have more you know you you might say that uh, we're not some all Keynes and the economics departments have turned away from Keynes but I can tell you when you spend turned to whom Friedman Chicago boys in, in, in Naomi Klein. More, more, yeah, more neoclassical economics uh, than Keynesian. But the truth is, uh -huh. when you spend huge amounts of money on the milita military, that's Keynesian economics. We have more yeah. Keynesian yeah. economics today yeah. uh, than, we, uh, than we had in 1933 or 35 or the heyday of the Democrats. We have, we, we have plenty of Keynes. But my only point yeah. is that there's another policy. Yeah. And that policy is to universalize the right to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. But and what it will do... Mm -hmm will distribute income broadly through the productive process, yeah. support the profitable employment of unused capacity, yeah. promote growth, uh -huh. and give people a way to earn without working to uh -huh. supplement uh -huh. their labor wages and to supplement any welfare benefits that okay. they get. And that's, that should be on the table. That oh, should be discussed. I couldn't agree no, with you more. No, no additional generation uh -huh. of student 
should graduate without that understanding. We, we don't need this chart now. We, we don't. Take it, we can go back to uh, go back to the, the uh, off that chart. That's something that we got, and it's in the book. It's in your literature and so forth. We yes. got it on our site. They can go to. It's a little complicated. A lot of people would, would like to understand that. But what we need is an alternative. I just want to get a plug in for one book where. What if we're not Keynesians now? Uh, what, as we were, uh, you know, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and that sort of. What are we all now? What is the econ the prominent out of the old paradigm, the prominent uh, grounding principles and theoretical framework, econo in terms of economic policy? I would policy, say, if you look at it, would be Friedman with a little Shum Peter thrown in with creative entrepreneurialism. What is it? Whatever it is, it's not adequate to what the future requires, it would mm -hmm. seem to me. And the binary notion that you bring up does question all of that. Mm -hmm. And it's not, if I'm not mistaken, you're teaching up in uh, Syracuse, but mm -hmm. this idea is never mentioned it's, in it's, uh, it's, most of the political dialogue. It's all a matter of reifying the old institutions by e and large. Even the dissenters. Which makes your efforts up at Syracuse even, and a few other e people around the world extremely important, rather like Galileo in his early he, years when he was uh, scoffed he, at he, by the people who were not wanting to see this new paradigm that's emerging. He, even the dissenters, there's, there's an umbrella group called the Institute for, uh, for Pluralist Economics, and I went to a conference of that and I presented some binary, binary stuff and tried to get a paper published. They, they, they publish X, Y, or Z also, but they don't, they don't they, at this point, they don't, they don't have any reference to binary economics, I asked them whether they, anything in their anything in the papers they decided to publish would alert people to the notion that it's important to enable people to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. No response. And these are the dissenters. These yeah. are the people that supposedly yeah. take exception. But to answer to your question, yeah. neoclassical economics uh, is, is the dominant approach, in neo, and that assumes technology constant. That assumes uh, uh, skills constant. Uh, that's with taste constant, distribution irrelevant, mm. uh, it, it, ownership it, irrelevant. It, all of those things, and I can tell you, you can't be a fiduciary. You can't be. You can't run a company uh, <coughs> profitably from the management point of view. You can't dis determine government policy when you hold technology constant, skills constant, tastes constant. In a uh, world that's the ecology irrelevant, the distribution irrelevant. You can't do that. In a world that is qualitatively no, you, you, and exponentially you, you being you transformed before you our very eyes. You yeah. you Naomi do. Klein has written a book that gets a lot of uh, play. We're on public access. We have a lot of what would loosely be mm. called progressive-minded yeah. people. And uh, she's written a book that is a scathing and very well-written, highly recommended attack on uh, the Chicago school. Yes. Does she have a solution? No. She ha well, she has a solution at this point. What I'm getting at beyond, um, it's a good book. She's a real scholar. She's worth reading, and mm -hmm. everyone should read and get in touch with her, I would suggest. But uh, what she said is she takes some flack, as she calls it on a couple of interviews, from the progressive community because she believes in a mixed economy, not a socialist economy where we do away with private property and that Marxist leftist critique that they do. Yes, yes. Why has the left been so blinkered by the labor theory of value, wanting to get some better wages for people or something, from being able to see, because you have a great deal of intellectual talent in those quarters, and they seem to be blinkered behind this idea of the labor theory of value without being able to get involved with the thing, uh, the, the vision of a binary world of distributing income increasingly to greater numbers of people in terms of the way it's actually being produced by linking them to the reality why do you think the progressive, apart from the conservative uh, community, why do you think the progressive community is so blinkered to being able to think about something new as a way to challenge effectively the system that's in place that I is out of date and must be qualitatively transformed if we avoid the negative side of our <laughs> capability, I don't know the, the uh, destruction of our species to allow for a system that is in keeping with what the future requires to realize human liberation, ecological well-meaning and justice in the universe. Why are they so blinkered? Okay, I don't, I don't think there's a single answer to that question. I will say that having debated with people on the left, that the left, uh, many people on the left believe that it is a moral virtue mm -hmm. to distribute the surplus that is created by capital and labor mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. without regard to which is making the bigger contribution. Mm -hmm. It is a virtue to distribute the surplus of capital and labor through wages and welfare 
And yeah. it is counterproductive to distribute the, the, the surplus of, in capital, of capital and labor through, through the, the private ownership. Of private capital. ownership That's, is an evil so, institution so, so in their I think, is, I that, think, is that their I thing? Think, they got to think it's I evil. I think that is in some people's minds. They and, call and, privatization and, and I just the want great bugaboo. And, and I, I, again, I'm always trying to talk to the men and women of the audience, the boy, boys and girls, to give them a fresh look. You probably have never heard of the term, the right to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. That's probably a term you've never heard. And again, with the earnings of capital is, the, is that joinder that has to be there. If you talk about broad ownership, say, what, you mean with the earnings of capital? So we've probably never heard that before, but I would suggest to you that if you think, re rethink the 20th century, that issue, the right to acquire capital with the earnings of capital, was the moving the economic dynamic force behind most of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Bolshevik Revolution occurred in 1917, but there were several pre preceding revolutions. Oh, yeah. And from those preceding revolutions to the, bulk, to the Bolshevik Revolution, to the collapse of the Soviet Union, what we call the West was defending the right to acquire capital with the earnings of capital for the few. That's the logic of business and finance. That's the logic of corporate finance. And the, 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 the socialist countries, the communist countries, not socialist, the communist countries, were seeking to establish a legal system that outlawed the right to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. So ask yourself whether your education has been fair to you, however old you are right now, having never heard of a right called the right to acquire capital with the earnings of capital. For the when, when that issue, when yeah. that issue moved and shaped the political dynamics of the 20th century. Okay, the 20th century, what we're looking for is a pattern that will be able to effectively shape the pattern of the 21st century. That's right. We need a system uh, that is understood. It's the intellectuals, in a sense, are falling down on the job. I would say, particularly the progressive intellectuals, are not providing an effective alternative. They should have something that can, in, a certain, in their own interest of the plutocratic class, and hoist them, in a sense, on their own petard, call them at their own game, and give them a challenge that will force them to think about something new that they will be able to go along yes. with, in the end, on their own terms, like we can include Mr. Newton in our, in our thinking and so forth. They did things that were there. They have a responsible participation mm -hmm. in this, too. So we might be able to have a pattern where everybody wins in a certain sense, non-zero sum. That's what we're trying to create in a non-violent kind of transformation. Win-win. Absolutely. Uh, without Binary the, without the spin win -win. of the PR industry and one of the problems is we run out of time always. We run out of time with this second. Your pleasure to have had the perceptions. Robert Ashford, major voice for an economic way of thinking that is uh, something that should be on the think tank of every, uh, and the agenda of every think tank and university in this country, uh, destined to become so, I think, and it'll be good when there gets to be public support behind this idea as an alternative to traditional ideas that are being uh, trotted out all the time and uh, are not adequate what the future requires. Bob, thanks for being in a visionary uh, position in that regard, and thank you for viewing. We'll be coming back again tomorrow. Thank you very much for Margaret Borges and uh, Paula, uh, Paula here, Paula Gloria, helping us put this together. We'll be coming back again tomorrow. Bob, drive very, or get very safely back home and uh, keep up the work. Look forward to the conferences coming up in January, in, uh, in December, on some of these issues of the American Bar Association. The Association of American Law Schools. That's right. Binary yeah. Economics will have a small but important presence at well, that conference. Well, Ma Margaret Mead said of small things, that's where the real changes come. Okay, thank you for viewing. Thank you, folks. You could go to black, I think, you know. Like,